All right, while well, everybody's getting situated, I'm going to do the honors of the introduction. It's quite lengthy. I can tell you that's why I want to get started. It's really a great pleasure to welcome Dr. David Brovich for our Pioneers in Biomedical Research Seminar Series. Dr. Rovich is truly a pioneer in neuroscience and its application to clinical med medicine, particularly neonatology and uh, pediatric uh, neurology. Dr. Rovich uh, got his MD degree from UCLA and a PhD degree from Cambridge in 1989. Um, he then uh, did his clinical training at Boston Children's Hospital in pediatrics and neonatology. He did a five-year postdoc at Harvard, where he stayed then through the ranks of assistant and associate professor until 2006. He was recruited uh, to UCSF uh, as a professor in pediatrics and neurology. And in 2008, he became a Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute investigator uh, at uh, UCSF. Um, he was recruited away or uh, cho chose to move back to Cambridge where he did his PhD work in 2016 and he now is the chair of pediatrics and the Wellcome Trust senior investigator and director of clinical studies in Clare College, Cambridge. He's, uh, he's an exemplary uh, practicing physician who's also a scientist and he's pioneered in both his world and his clinical world and his basic science world. He was the first to establish, or he established the first neuro NIC ICU in the country, really focusing on neurological illnesses in neonates and uh, setting new standards for uh, care of these patients. He launched the first uh, clinical study, clinical trial, implanting neural stem cells into the human brain uh, to treat a very rare X-linked uh, demyelinating disorder calling, uh, caused, uh, called Pelissier's Mirsbar disease, and he's going to talk a little bit about that today, I know. As researcher at, uh, at the Howard Hughes Institute, uh, he really informed our understanding on genetic factors that determine development and the diversity of glial cells. Um, and just to name some of the things we take for granted today, he contributed to textbook knowledge, such as Oleg 1 and 2. He described Oleg 1 and 2 as being the transcript transcription factors essential for oligodendrocyte uh, maturation and differentiation and their role in certain diseases such as gliomas. He identified the wind pathway as being an inhibitory pathway for oligodendrocyte differentiation. He used a large-scale faith mapping and showed the diversity of astrocytes that really was unheard of until that point, showing well over 100 different subtypes of astrocytes. He described a uh, migratory pathway for neural stem cell that is active only in the uh, third trimester of human development and is likely uh, the cells that are adversely affected in preterm birth, giving rise to a cerebral palsy. And in a re very recent Nature paper, he made elegant use of large-scale uh, transcriptomic mapping to show how uh, at the lesions of MS patients, there are cell type specific uh, changes associated with these lesions. He's published over 170 articles. Uh, he won numerous prestigious awards, and I'm just going to name a couple. The Kimmel Scholar Award from the Sydney Kimmel Foundation for Cancer Research, the Weaver Neuroscience Scholar Award from the MS Society, and the James McDonald Foundation Award. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Rovich, who's going to talk to us about the genome and the way forward for pediatric medicine. Thanks very much, Harold, for that very kind introduction. Um, and uh, Harold and I went on a trail run um, at a Gordon conference, and we started to chat about what was life like in the UK. So you can tell from my accent that I'm from California, I'm from the US, trained as a doctor here, um, and now I'm practicing in the NHS. And uh, are there perspectives that maybe the medical students and some of the physicians in the audience might be interested to hear? Um, as a US physician, how do I feel about practicing in England? Plus, what are the advantages for research? So um, this is going to be a more clinically oriented talk, uh, although I do want to get into this condition called Pellissier's Merzbacher disease that um, Harold mentioned. Um, first, what can the US learn from the UK healthcare system? Um, diagnostics, whole genome sequencing now that we're implementing systematically for intensively ill children, what's the benefit of that to diagnosis of genetic diseases in children? Um, and then what can we do about it? How are we going to use this information for therapeutics 
that will be for these rare conditions. And then ultimately, we're going to try to get insights about better predicting health risks in children so that we can really develop individualized care to make them stronger and give them a foundation for a healthy life. And that's what I'll come back to in something that we call the predictome. Could the pediatrician, when a baby's born, really have a good sense of the health risks in store for that child and then do something about it in time so that chronic diseases don't occur? Big questions, and, and where do I think the UK can kind of contribute to that? So I'm going to start now with uh, there are a couple of videos here, and, and this is because I think they, they make a case that you might as well hear from some of the experts uh, and then uh, rather than hear it from me. So here. Back At King's College Hospital in London, Dr. Nigel Heaton performs a liver transplant surgery with a live donor. A young man is giving part of his liver to his younger brother. So that's the piece of liver that's just taking out here. We're just going to flush it down. The liver is cut in half with one part for the younger brother and the other part staying in the donor. The liver is a remarkable organ in that it's, it's made up of eight segments. So you can take pieces of the liver and it'll function perfectly well. This transplant costs tens of thousands of dollars. But under Britain's National Health Service, or NHS, the patient doesn't pay a thing. When patients come to us, we only evaluate them from the point of view of their need. Do they need a liver transplant? The cost never comes into it. As a surgeon, I love that because it means the focus is on the care that I can deliver. Nobody pays a doctor's bill on the NHS. People will go their entire life without paying a single upfront cost. Hello, smart. Dr. Claire Gerarda is the chair of Britain's Royal College of General Practitioners. Our health service is fair. It means that irrespective of what you can afford, irrespective of your illness, you will be able to access health care. T.R. Reid, a former overseas bureau chief with the Washington Post, toured the world's health care systems for his recent book, The Healing of America. The least efficient payers in the world are the American private insurance companies. They have administrative costs of 20 to 30 percent. That's a 30 percent tax on every dollar you spend on health care. Uh, Britain is totally socialized medicine, administrative costs 5 percent. Canada is private doctors and public payers, 6 percent administrative costs. So it turns out in health care, governments are doing this more efficiently than our private sector. Okay, so um, again, just but a little bit of a taste of, of what medicine in the NHS might be like. I hope there are no administrator, hospital administrators in the audience. Um, so what is the NHS? It is a single-payer system. It costs 8.4% of gross domestic product. It covers 100% of the population, um, and that means even when you visit England, when you get off the plane, you are covered by the NHS. And then it also provides regionalized care, and that has advantages to research that I want to kind of get into also during the talk. Um, this shows a little bit what they were referring to in, the, in that previous segment, um, the cost, GDP cost per country, with the U.S. being, you know, spending the most on health care um, worldwide, and that's to cover probably 60 to 70 percent of the population with at least 30 million that probably don't have health insurance. And then the European countries in the U.K. being down at the bottom. And uh, here's another example. I got to Cambridge. I'm an neonatologist. What is what is the take to, to what does it cost to take care of this baby who's intensively ill, who's on a ventilator, a little preterm baby? 1,200 pounds per day. And then at UCSF, when I had to look at the balance books, um, same child, hospital charges of $30,000 per day. So uh, I think this is probably what it does cost to take care of a baby. Um, and you know, we, when we think about administrative costs and all the other <clears throat> high costs we're paying, clearly it can be done cheaper than, than the US is doing it. That's one, one thing to keep in mind. And then here's another, and this is pretty scary, and I think as a US physician, I thought, you know, US medicine, we're the best in the world, we have access to all the latest drugs, rah, rah. And then I get to the UK and you start to really see how does, the, how does Europe view the US, and they'll look at it through this lens, which are health outcomes, infant mortality, you know, what are, what are um, you know, um, the overall statistics applied across the population, not just if you're, let's say, Boston Children's Hospital. And the U.S. comes out to have the worst health outcomes of the 11 wealthiest nations in the world, uh, and then European countries are going to be exceeding that. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't seem like very good value. Um, 
The 2013 Institute of Medicine report also came up with the same conclusions looking at U.S. health outcomes compared to other countries. So you could say our ca cancer outcomes are the best in the world if you're at MP Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Dana-Farber. But that's not representative of, of what access people have across the country, and that's where we do poorly in the U.S. is these pockets of disparities where there's either no access to the same medical care or people without resources who can't get access. So to me now, um, you know, we have a big problem in the U.S., which is how do we, uh, you know, address these disparities and how could we kind of achieve better health outcomes? And then there's another just overall issue of cost. Is it sustainable to have, you know, 20% of GDP going to, to medical care? Um, or do we need to start to think about other healthcare systems or maybe even, even new approaches to healthcare? So as you will know, Reactive is our method. If we go to your doctor when we have a problem, and then that doctor will do what they think is needed. And we know that that is just resulting in escalating costs. So there has to be an antidote to this whole approach that we have in the US. And so there's a lot of interest in preventive medicine and trying to you know, uh, identify the people at risk and sort of apply something to be sure that they are going to, we can delay the onset of a chronic disease or even maybe prevent that. Now, pediatrics doesn't enter into the conversation as much as it should, but, but if you think about it logically, shouldn't we be thinking about prevention right from birth? And so this is where we are thinking in Cambridge, you know, we really want to shift that curve. We want to really put um, new tools on the table so that we're able to um, identify a baby who may have an acute health risk or may have a distant health risk, and there may be prevention, there may be particular either drugs or other types of interventions that could be done to prevent onset of genetic diseases, cancer, mental health, obesity, diabetes, and some of the chronic diseases that we think you know, occur in middle age, but probably their origins are much earlier. And that's what we want to focus on, identifying those biomarkers for origins and then interventions early. Um, so where we are, we are working in Cambridge in our strategy is to now try to show the benefits of early diagnosis, um, try to develop more. Uh, reliable ways of predicting health risks, and then can we institute preventive approaches and start to show how that is, you know, better treatment. Um, we do want to apply this to children with the idea that we can show a maximum lifelong benefit. Um, and so, you know, I don't think prevention starts here. It starts, you know, much further to the left. And a key tool that we're going to use is genomic medicine. Uh, now, I think everyone here is familiar with what DNA is, but I do want to point out a couple of little factoids so that you know what whole genome sequencing is compared to some of the other techniques you may be familiar with. Um, there are 3.2 billion um, base pairs per 23 chromosomes, or about 6 billion base pairs. Um, and when we talk about whole genome sequencing, that means we are sequencing everything. So that is 6 billion base pairs of data that we're doing in a whole genome test. That's in contrast to a whole exome test that will test for the, you know, the, the coding regions of the 20,000 or so genes. Smaller test, but arguably that's where the money is. That's where a lot of the, you know, gene mutations that are known are in the exome. What you do not capture here is all the intergenic regions. And if we think about this from a research point of view, in the future we're going to probably find many more mutations that will be outside the genes, and these will be things that will regulate how highly the gene is turned on or whether it comes on in the right time and place. These will be regulatory region mutations that will lie um, in, you know, in this space versus the, versus the exome space. So that was just a little bit of background I wanted to provide. Now why genome medicine in pediatrics? Is it just for, you know, what, people think of these um, genetic diseases rare and not so important, but they're incredibly important. As a pediatrician, you see these on a day-to-day -day basis. And 30 percent of hospital admissions will be driven by kids with genetic diseases. So these are, these are um, children that also have very serious conditions, and it's one of the leading causes of death in children less than one year of age. Uh, and so this is where we think in, this, in pediatrics we can really make an impact with bringing in whole genome sequencing into our intensive care units. So we've been working with a geneticist, uh, Lucy Raymond. Uh, we asked a simple question, if we use whole genome sequencing, can we detect? Um, uh, rare diseases or genetic diseases in intensively ill children in, in the neonatal ICU and pediatric ICU. Um, and this was also work pretty much single-handedly of one postdoc, Courtney French. Um, we developed a rapid turnaround whole genome sequencing um, pipeline. Uh, and this, uh, for any of you who are familiar with genetics, is a, is a fairly typical 
um, type of pathway where the clinician will identify the patients at risk. We will consent and recruit the family. In this case, we are going to do the, the baby and the parents, it's something called a trio. And that means we can look immediately for inherited or so-called de novo conditions that will just be one-offs occurring in the baby. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. Uh, then. Uh, you know, the samples need to be processed in genetics lab. It goes to a sequencer. We've done all of our sequencing with Illumina. And then the heavy lifting and the real hard work is the data interpretation. This is what Courtney does, uh, which is you look through these, you know, six billion base pairs for the baby and for the parents. Um, what's different in that baby? Is it a gene that could be accounting for a baby's presentation in ICU, seriously ill children, kid? We discuss that in a multidisciplinary team. We then validate the result, and it goes back to the clinician is clinically accredited. And we can do this now in 14 days and think we can get it down to about 10 days. And, and probably in the future, this is going to be even faster. It'll probably just be a couple days, and we'll have a whole genome test for any of the medical students in the audience. Um, this will be you know, a test you will use if you're certainly in pediatrics on a regular basis. And then in other fields, we're sort of determining how useful it's going to be. Um, but part of this is. Rapid turnaround um, is needed when you have an ICU situation, and the reason is, as you can imagine, you're dealing with life and death situations, and so you need that answer quickly. Um, in other situations, um, where maybe you want to identify something about your family history, you don't need it in 14 days. You can wait a couple months. So this, this rapid turnaround is specific to, you know, intensively ill when you need a real quick answer. Um, this shows that in the UK, there's a very high recruitment for genetic studies. Uh, and this might surprise some people who do clinical research in the U.S. that about 50 percent of the families were, um, were consented to have whole genome sequencing done. There's a very sort of, uh, I guess, trusting attitude about the NHS. It's partly because there are no pre-existing conditions. And so, um, in fact, when we looked at these numbers more carefully, we determined that 25 percent more would have consented. It's just that um, when they come to our hospital, we turn them around back to their local hospital so quickly that we didn't have time to properly consent them. So we probably will have a very high consent rate. Most of them were trios in our study, uh, with a couple of cases where we couldn't get the whole family. And then this shows what we found. Now, this is a result that can potentially vary depending on the region of the world that you're in. Uh, so this is Cambridge. Now, these are going to be you know, graduate students and professors, and um, but we also recruit from the region around the east of England. So it's a, actually a very economically diverse. It's both the richest and the poorest region of England. Uh, so we have a whole spectrum of patients that will come to us. And so uh, when we check to see what kinds of mutations there are, it's about one third that would be inherited from the parents and two thirds that are de novo. That means you know it happens in that child, but it was not passed on from the parents. That has obvious implications for how you will counsel the family about future pregnancies. Um, so I think I have a couple of examples of some, um, you know, cases of, of inherited and de novo, um, and shows also sort of how this test can be helpful in uh, working. Uh, yes, Michelle. On your last slide, is that percentage of patients, about 30% of the total trios that you tested, or are all of the trios that you tested Oh, sorry. So, so I was going to get to that. Our diagnostic rate overall is about 30 percent. So of the 30 percent, um, this, there's two-thirds. Right. These are just of the diagnoses. But I'll come back to that. Thanks. Um, so here's, here's a case of a, of a condition which is uh, generally considered lethal called myotubular myopathy, a 32-week preterm um, male who was admitted with hypotonia and breathing difficulties need to go on to the ventilator. And what we will typically do with kids like this uh, in the NICU or in our pediatric ICU will be multiple investigations. Um, and you know some of these will involve invasive testing, like muscle biopsy, or different ways of measuring m muscle function or cardiac function. Uh, and you know the way that doctors work is if we don't have the answer, we think of another test to do. And if that doesn't work, we think of another specialist to bring in. And it's something that's called the diagnostic odyssey. And it's something that, that all rare disease uh, patients and families have experienced. Um, if you don't do the right test, the testing continues to escalate and it continues to go on. So this kid um, lived for about six weeks and had multiple investigations done during this time. Now, um, we had in parallel, uh, and as we were just working up our research pipeline, we found at uh, 14 days of life that he had a MTM1 mutation. Now, that was a point where we weren't clinically accredited, and so we couldn't really use that to tell the clinician what to do. But 
actually, if, if you look at when we had this diagnosis and then the six weeks of life that it took to do all these other tests, we might have saved this child from having so much extra stuff done to him. Uh, it's a fatal condition. The family um, did um, consider the options and they per were persuaded that they did not want to continue to provide life support. And so this, this, this patient did have withdrawal of support. Um, now, um, there is a rapid change in sort of our understanding of the genome and also the therapeutic options that are available. So one month after this child died, and I think the entire medical team agreed, you know, there was nothing where we could, we could offer this child, and the parents were definite that they didn't want to put them through anymore. But then one month later, there's a new gene therapy trial that's announced for MTM1, uh, which is an adeno-associated virus gene therapy. This is a field that is changing very quickly. So what we need to be able to do is not only provide these accurate diagnoses, but then really keep in touch with industry and really look at what's on the horizon um, and keep the parents informed about new options. Um, because potentially this is a family that would have elected for clinical trial. It's just that when they had to make the decision, there was no clinical trial announced. Again, it's a conundrum a bit, but this is, this is where there's also a lot of um, change and where I think pediatrics is starting to really switch on to how we can um, uh, start to, to do better for our patients if we include these techniques. This is an example of an inherited mutation. So here is now the child's mutation. The father does not have it. This one came from the mom. So when it comes to future pregnancies, now we can offer that to um, the parents if they want to get a prenatal diagnosis. Um, here's another locus. It's called CDKL5. This, this, is, this causes a rare neurogenetic condition. And here are a couple of examples of a, um, a de novo uh, CDKL5 mutation. And that's here. It's a point mutation, but it uh, will cause seizures and an autism-like syndrome in the child and you can see the parents don't have it. So this is a de novo. So that, would, again, will help us with pregnancy counseling. Um, we can also withhold genome sequencing because we're testing all six billion base pairs. We get all sorts of unusual, we can detect unusual structural variants. And so here is a variant of CDKL5 in which there's a duplication and inversion. And whole genome sequencing will allow you to pick that up. Essentially, it's a one-stop shop. It will allow you to pick up mitochondrial disorders, all structural variants, copy number variants, and everything you need to know about the DNA is in whole genome sequencing. There's pretty much the Primo test. Um, is it offered clinically in the U.S.? No, um, but it is just beginning to be offered. Oh, sorry, I take that back. Uh, UC San Diego is starting to use whole genome uh, sequencing uh, in the NICU. And uh, in the UK, I'm going to describe how this is really going to take hold in a big way. So we have um, now um, we have now tested over 450 um, families with whole genome sequencing. We have 113 diagnoses. The point of this slide is to show you that we get a spectrum of genetic conditions. There's nothing that is a particular number one driver of kids coming to the, to the NICU or to the pediatric ICU with genetic conditions. There's not like a particular gene in the east of England that is the one that is driving kids into to NICU. There are a bunch of different syndromes, although overall, 50 percent of them are neurological. So as we go forward, we're really going to be thinking much more about how we can bring in um, the scientific community and others to start to think about some of the novel genes that we're going to find that are influencing um, neurological function. Also, another point, um, in case there are any geneticists in the audience, you know, when do you order a whole genome test? And often a geneticist and, and a clinician will want to look for particular features that are characteristic of a syndrome. Imagine a child with Down syndrome. There's a particular, you know, look to that child that will make you think about getting the genetic test, and you can apply that sort of approach to all sorts of genetic syndromes. But in babies, the, the, the facial and other features are very subtle. So in our case, we found that neonates often lack the expected phenotypes. And so the advice to neonatologists is if you have a sick child and you don't really know what's going on, you do whole genome sequencing without thinking about it too much. They may not fit the picture that you have of a particular genetic syndrome. And again, it's helping to inform the guidance that we're providing as we start to scale up this approach in the UK. Um, this, these different. Um, colored um, check boxes here show the ways that of the, when we have diagnoses, how it has changed care. And it's a little bit hard to read, but, you know, there's, a, there's an impact of diagnosis. One of those is you stop doing more testing. So that's really, that's almost always the case. When you get a diagnosis, the diagnostic odyssey stops. Uh, and then sometimes we'll bring in specialists that are tailored to that genetic condition. 
Um, there may be specialized treatments. Uh, there might be a recurrence risk for pregnancy. Um, and even post-mortem, sometimes we've done this, and that's provided an answer for a family who, of course, is desperate and doesn't know what happened. Post-mortem diagnosis can also actually be helpful. So essentially, all the times that we've had a diagnosis, it has impacted care. Now, oh, this is a, a video, again, it's going to kind of say the impact of care, but from the patient's point of view, and I think uh, the, uh, hopefully you can understand an East of England accent. You'll, this will be a test of your... Uh, this is life at its most vulnerable, made even more perilous when the cause of a baby's sickness is unknown. In some cases, it can take months or even years to get a diagnosis, but that is set to change because of genome sequencing. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> Millie May and her parents, Claire and Chris, each had their genome, their entire genetic code, sequenced to try to discover why she was having life-threatening seizures. The result showed Millie May has a rare form of epilepsy caused by a single gene error, not inherited from her parents. It led to immediate improvements in her care. Since we've had the diagnosis, it's been a lot better. We had, uh, we had to change one of her medications um, due to the fact that the one that she was on was obviously aggravating um, the type of epilepsy that she has. We saw a big difference as soon as that change was made. It's priceless. That one test result obviously allowed us to put all the correct people in place and make the best for her. Sequencing the billions of letters of DNA code that make up a genome used to be hugely expensive. Now it costs less than a thousand pounds. Scientists in Cambridge analysed the genomes of 350 children in intensive care, comparing it to the DNA of their parents. They found one in four children had a genetic disorder and were able to give the diagnosis in two weeks. This study shows conclusively that whole genome sequencing is a real benefit to patients, speeding up diagnosis and helping to find the right treatment. From next year, throughout England, the NHS will offer whole genome testing to all babies and children where the cause of their illness is unknown. The first national health service in the world to do so. So, so um, to summarize um, kind of where our, where our project is, uh, as I mentioned now, we're up to about 450 patients. Um, early detection of serious genetic conditions in one in five babies in NICU, one in four in PICU. When we look at kids in intellectual disability clinic, it's closer to 50 percent. Um, and, um, you know, genetic diagnosis has changed clinical management in all cases. And as, as the Fergus Walsh mentioned that piece, what's also amazing about the NHS is how you can scale very rapidly. So we go from a project in Cambridge, and then the government, you know, thinks this is a great example of how a new technology can benefit patients. And now this is going to be a service that could be available nationally in just a year. Incredible. Now, can we, can we really take advantage of that and build research into it? And I want to kind of now sort of switch to, you know, again, okay, so let's say now we're going to have this great diagnostic capability. We're going to identify kids with these problems earlier. Okay, what are the treatments we can plug in? And what are the types of things that we can think forward to in pediatrics to be able to offer? And I'll be talking in, in this talk mainly about kids with rare and serious genetic diseases. And I'll come back to common diseases at the, in, at the end. Um, so here are the types of things that we'd be thinking about. Stratified medicines for neurogenetic conditions. So these could include um, new treatments for neonatal seizures, and some of these might be gene therapies like uh, adeno-associated virus-mediated therapies, antisense oligonucleotide therapies, or maybe gene editing, or repurposing drugs. So these are, this really is just sort of pharmacogenomics. We've got a lot of drugs. We've got 10 anticonvulsants to choose from. <coughs> Maybe depending on a genetic condition, one works better than others. Maybe some are bad. Like if you have certain mitochondrial disorders, valproate is toxic. So you can't, you know, you'd like to know that um, before you choose the drug that's going to be right for that child. Um, and then there's also a lot we don't know. So we really need to involve the basic scientist and really look at the function of some of these genes and, and disease models to understand mechanisms that could be addressed with new therapies. So that could be um, relevant for thinking about new cell-based therapies um, and maybe IPS or organoid models for drug screens, 
you know, which will then give us those repurposing drugs to be able to use. So I want to kind of give some examples of that, so look, put a little bit of meat on the bones with, with, with respect to these different concepts, because there's progress in all, all of these domains. So I was going to start with neonatal seizures. Um, now, uh, this is a common reason that a baby will be admitted to NICU, both in the U.S. and in the U.K., uh, and it's reckoned that there are about 2,000 children admitted to neonatal ICU with seizures per year in the U.K. Um, it's challenging to diagnose, and the, the prognosis and the treatment will depend on the underlying cause. Um, but do we actually do the right diagnostic um, paradigm to figure out the underlying cause? Um, and then neonatologists will treat with the same drug all the time. It's called phenobarbital here. It's called phenobarbitone in, in Europe. Again, if anybody is, um, is familiar with seizure treatment, it's like the first-line drug. Um, and we don't do a stratified approach is the bottom line. So we're not, we're not, um, we're not there yet. Um, now, wh wh how would you approach this in a regionalized healthcare system? Now we're talking about Cambridge Children's, which will be in the center of the east of England. That lies here. Um, and London will be sort of right down there. It's a 45-minute train ride in case anybody wants to visit Cambridge. Um, about 1.5 million children live in the east of England, 80,000 deliveries per year. Cambridge is the hub for those. So, you know, that's our practice catchment. So it's a large cohort of, of kids that we would be seeing. And then if they don't come to NICU but they have a neurological problem, they'd be seen by the regional um, child development center. Again, large numbers is part of our practice model. Therefore, we can reach out with research that can now start to be applied to large numbers. So if we think about neonatal seizures, and this is now a video, um, and if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you know, how many, of the, how many of you think this is a baby that's sleeping or is it a baby that's seizing? Um, and uh, it is a video. You'll see the nurse going in and out of the frame, and you'll see that the oxygen saturation is about 98 to 100 percent. Um, and I wouldn't say that that's a baby that's seizing if I just look from across the room. But if we have EEG attached, this is a baby in status epilepticus. And so in, in babies, um, subclinical seizures are very common. So there's only one way to diagnose a seizure in, in babies, and that is by EEG. Now, once we've made a diagnosis of, of seizures, you want to apply a couple of other approaches to stratify that diagnosis. Uh, MRI, and now we have um, MRI-compatible incubators where the baby is nice and warm and quiet. Uh, environment inside, head coil inside the incubator, that whole thing goes into the MRI and you get a much better resolution scan. And that can show you whether the baby might have a brain malformation or hypoxic ischemic cephalopathy or stroke. Those could be causes for seizures and depending on the cause, you'll treat them differently. Uh, and then what's been missing um, in the picture often has been genomics because there will also be, will, there will also be rare genetic um, neonatal encephalopathy syndromes and they could also present as seizures. Uh, now, one, one example of, of why you'd want to bring genomics in is you want to be able to diagnose a baby that has channelopathy, uh, like KCNQ2, because that one will respond to a particular anticonvulsant carbamazepine, and it's an example of how we use that sort of stratified medical approach. So here's some papers from Roberta Chilio, uh, Chilio who's at the University of Brussels, um, showing the efficacy of carbamazepine for KCNQ2 mutations. <laughs> Babies with this problem will be in status on the wrong drug. They go on this drug, breastfeeding, go home a few days later. It's really remarkable how well this can work. And we're going to start to see, I think, that we're going to use this approach with a variety of the genetic and uh, epilepsy syndromes. Here's just a current list of some of the syndromes and where they might, you know, present in the early years of life. And um, I think. Where is KCNQ2? Anyway, it's one, it's one of those would have the drug carbamazepine. Um, KCNQ3 has quinidine, and probably for a variety of these seizures, we're going to start to now treat them with specific drug regimens that are going to be just tailored based on, on their genetics and the response profiles. So new stratified medicines for genetic epilepsy syndromes. This will be a major focus of international working between children's hospitals around the world. They're all deciding that this is a great example of how we can apply stratified medicine in pediatrics based on a genomic diagnosis. Um, and, you know, for the people in the audience that are interested in seizures, which I know you are, and or channels, which I know you are, um, I think there'll be a lot of very interesting things that will come out, mutations that could be very valuable potentially to model in mice or other animal systems. Uh, we know there's a human functional relevance, um, but we might not understand the basic biology or we may not have, you know, necessarily drugs to treat that condition, and that's an example of where we can work better with um, scientists. 
Now, uh, uh, Harold also mentioned, you know, um, something about cell-based therapies for pelletized Merzbacher disease. So I also want to um, tell you about work that we've done uh, and how that's progressed, kind of from a clinical trial into the lab, and we think now back to the back to the bedside again. And this will concern cell-based therapies and um, stem cell therapies. And this is to, uh, I guess, just remind people who are unfamiliar with uh, with neural stem cells that they will have. Um, you know, self-renewal and, and multipotent properties, and they can create the three cardinal uh, neuroepithelial cells of the brain, and then um, axons, which are sort of electrical conduits that would be um, myelinated um, by oligodendrocytes. Um, and so these videos, you know, again, like apologies for these videos, but I just, I, just, I don't know, they, 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 I don't want to assume that people know what an oligodendrocyte is. Um, obviously, the brain has electrical connections, and what the oligodendrocyte is doing is shown here, where it, by providing myelin, will increase conduction velocity, essentially for certain kinds of axons that are myelinated. Not all axons are myelinated. Axons have different diameters, and it's part of the way that we can tune a repertoire of neuron signaling to be faster or slower effectively. It is critically important for brain function, and that's illustrated by um, a disease Oh, this is also just showing that MRI, you know, is a great way of, of looking at myelinated axon tracks, and this is diffusion tensor imaging, which can beautifully sort of show in a, you know, living human being um, how their cortical, um, how cortical connections might appear. Um, and then here's the human disease that shows why myelin is absolutely critical for survival, um, and it's the disease Peltase, Merzbacher disease, or PMD. Um, parents describe their ch children as trapped in a brain uh, without myelin because their child, you know, is sort of trying to interact and will look at you and seems to be, you know, you, you can tell there's a person there, but they can't crawl, sit, stand up, or say a word, and then death by 10 years of age, and that's with sort of maximal medical interventions. Um, and so that sort of really shows you, uh, if you didn't believe that multiple sclerosis is a good example of why myelin's important, PMD is the worst case scenario. Um, it's caused by point mutations of, of, of a myelin protein called PLP1, which is a transmembrane um, spanning um, protein. And some of the more serious mutations are point mutations within the membrane domain. So you can imagine that the protein is completely disrupted. Um, and uh, this is a disease of oligodendrocytes, defective oligodendrocytes that can't produce myelin and can't because they have this mutation of PLP1. Um, here's an MRI that shows this dramatic hypomyelination in PMD where myelin on a T2-weighted image will look sort of charcoal colored uh, in these tracks here. And you can see how this opacity is present in the PMD brain. Global hypomyelination, again, consistent with the uh, severe neurological uh, phenotype I just showed you before. So this has no effective therapy, and then there are three, uh, three potential ways forward if we want to now apply new technologies. One, we could fix the gene for PLP that's gone wrong. Um, second, we could find a drug that helps our cells work better. Or third, we can replace the defective oligodendrocytes entirely. Just, you know, do a transplant of um, functioning oligodendrocytes. That might help patients with, P with PMD. And, um, you know, this is where, as a clinician scientist who, you know, really had my roots in the lab and looking at ligodendrocyte biology, but then being asked to lead a clinical trial for PMD with neurosurgical colleagues um, was a case where it wa I was completely out of my comfort zone. But there was a biological logic to a study, which is we're going to try to give these kids, you know, cells that function and can make myelin. Um, oligodendrocytes are also proliferative and they can migrate so that you could argue once you've put the cells in, they could actually, you know, blossom and, and, and myelinate a larger area. So there was kind of a logic to this and you could actually detect those changes by MRI because I showed you how the MRI is so different in PMD. So we had a non-invasive biomarker in case it worked. There are all these sort of logical things that made this seem like a sensible um, uh, application of neural stem cell transplant. Um, and this was a proposition from a company called Stem Cells, Inc. They'd also done transplants of these human neural stem cells into a myelin-deficient mouse called Shiver, uh, and the cells could engraft into white matter tracts and make myelin-basic protein and actually start to provide donor myelin. So you had these ingredients that, again, made it seem um, like a logical application of a cell-based therapy. 
And, uh, and so we, we, we did, in fact, um, sub work with Stem Cell Inc. in this industry-sponsored trial to test the safety, phase one study, of injection of neural stem cells into the brains of four children with, with Palisades Merzbacher disease. And so the procedure was 75 million cells injected into four sites of sub subcortical white matter, and then we followed them for five years. Um, and as you can imagine, there'd be a lot of safety concerns around a study like this. And so studying for five years was, was one of the points we, we, were, we were insisted on. We really wanted to make sure that at least these, this would be safe. Um, what we were then going to do is apply MRI to look in the regions that were transplanted versus, you know, non-transplanted regions, and then look for differences that would be consistent with the um, um, uh, physical properties of myelin and they will increase something called fractional anisotropy. My, uh, MRIs are going to measure water movement, and myelin, because it's a fatty substance, will limit that. So increased fractional anisotropy is one of the, one of the properties of myelin, and also re decreased radiodiffusivity along axon tracks is another property of myelin. And this shows that in uh, two of the four children transplanted uh, that we did see these changes consistent with myelin properties in the first year after transplant. Um, and uh, then I wanted to make a point, because I know there are a couple of neurosurgeons in the audience, about what is the delivery like? Now, this was inefficient delivery of 75 million cells in four different sites. Um, this shows the uh, technique. I don't think this is my hand, because I'm not a neurosurgeon. So I wasn't actually doing the procedure, but I was. I had to like carry the cells into the operating theater. And uh, so what you're going to see is it's just like a syringe. So this is not high tech. Um, the, uh, this was a uh, brain lab stereotactic frame targeted therapy without intraoperative MRI because we didn't have it at the time. So the site is sort of, you know, uh, determined from a preoperative MRI scan, and then you have a frame that's going to guide your needle into just the right place you think, uh, and then the injection is being done. Um, with somebody sort of over 10 minutes injecting through a syringe by hand these 75 million cells. And what we saw was um, there was reflux um, and that the delivery was actually inefficient um, to all of the four sites. And the point I want to make here is that there's a whole area as we start to think about regenerative therapies for the brain that will have to do with delivery. And uh, we do not know how, you know, you, we, it's hard to do it in a mouse brain. Um, if you and, and it's exact, it's the same problem in a human brain where we're going to think about genes and cell-based therapies in the future for Alzheimer's and other diseases. Um, there's a whole technology development that's going to be needed to give us better approaches to delivery. So, uh, but what we did find is that there were not complications of delivery. The immunosuppression the kids needed. Uh, we did not detect tumor formation. Uh, one case there was suspected glio gliosis at one year that subsided. No clinical correlate. Um, we found persistent MRI findings that suggested engraftment of the cells in two of the four patients, but not definitive evidence of myelin. It's just MRI evidence. And none of the patients have died, and so we don't have any histological proof. So this does not show it helps the patients. It's a safety study. It doesn't even show that it makes myelin. But interestingly, year five, um, Jim Barkovich, the um, radiologist who is on the study, was saying, you know, that there were T1 hyperintensities that are compatible with the possibility that myelin is there. These are persistent changes that we saw in two of the four children. They're not at all four sites, but remember I told you we didn't really deliver all the cells that we wanted to at all four sites, so I actually think that asymmetry is in some ways reassuring. These are not tumors, um, and they have increased fractional anisotropy and decreased radiodiffusity, you know, which is the sort of characteristics of a myelinated axon. So is this myelin? Nobody can say, but it, at least we can say that, um, you know, that we see ongoing safety. I think that's fairly clear. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, should there be an efficacy study? Um, but then the company went bankrupt, so there is no phase two. So the families are kind of disappointed about that. Um, and um, we wanted to think about alternatives. Um, and uh, so this is where now, coming from a stem cell background, we can actually start to think about other ways we could work with those same patients, these four boys with terrible PMD, by harvesting fibroblasts and then using induced pluripotent stem cells to kind of get more insights into PMD, you know, potential um, insights for mechanism. This work that we did with Marius Wernig at Stanford University and his work of a postdoc of mine, uh, Hiroko Nobuda, who's now at Albert Einstein. So as you know, you know, you collect these skin fibroblasts, you can 
reprogram them into pluripotent stem cells. Now, at that point, we have some options. For genetic disease, you could also do gene correction or gene editing. Um, so now you could have a flavor that is a PMD mutant and a flavor that is wild type. And that, this can be your kind of control um, or your comparator groups. You can put them through in vitro differentiation. It is possible to induce oligodendrocytes in a dish. Um, and then you could submit those to drug screens. And so you could potentially find a problem that's rescued by a drug. And so, you know, um, anyway, that, that's, that, that was a sort of thought about starting this, this project. And to sort of fast forward um, to some of our, our findings, um, we found that the um, oligodendrocytes that came from the PMD patients um, underwent a sort of a early cell death at a stage when they're just about to start myelinating. Uh, and so what we would see, for example, is we would try to differentiate oligodendrocytes in a dish from a PMD patient that would express O4, and as it started to express MBP, it started to look small and contracted, and then that cell was on its way out. And that was in contrast to the gene-corrected cells that really showed a nice big bushy morphology and survived in culture, um, and, and some of that is quantified here, reduced cell death in the gene-corrected case. We took the cells and also transplanted them in vivo into the shiver mouse, the one that doesn't make myelin. And this would be an example of um, gene-corrected cells that after um, 16 weeks were still evident, um, whereas when we look for the ones that, here they are, higher power, making myelin. And then if we took the ones that were from the, the uncorrected case, it would be very rare to even find any of the cells. They, they seem to all die, and we never really found evidence for them making myelin. So, Hopefully you're convinced gene correction is, you know, um, uh, uh, sufficient to, you know, reverse the, this phenotype of, of cell death that we saw. And um, this is for, uh, just to, to kind of re review the, the cell death phenotype. So we're starting from an induced pluripotent stem cell getting to an oligodendrocyte precursor cell. We get to a premyelinating stage when it starts to express O4 and MBP dies before it makes it to this sort of terminally differentiated um, cell. What's the nature of cell stress? I'm not going to have time to go through all the details, but just sort of some of the highlights. They make a lot of reactive oxygen species. And so here's an assay that we can use to look for um, production of, of reactive oxygen species. And moreover, we can also detect that it's a lipid um, um, peroxidation pathway leading to reactive oxygen species. And this graph shows that in the gene corrected cells, we don't see this ROS production. Now, reactive oxygen species are obviously toxic at high levels, and so we thought that is the basis for cell death. It was also the basis for a drug screen, because now we could try to rescue this reactive oxygen species generation, and I won't have time again to take you through all that, but just the bottom line was that we find that these PMD oligodendrocytes are incredibly iron sensitive. Um, and iron is a known stressor, and you can imagine there'll be like iron overload is very toxic to liver, so let's now apply that to other cells like oligodendrocytes. Um, and that's what we found was that um, they were um, showing uh, evidence for lipid, iron-induced lipid peroxidation, which leads to membrane de degradation and cell death. There are, th these are some of the other toxic properties um, that iron could have that we also looked at. Um, and, the, and, the, and the cartoon at the left shows also how iron will normally get into the cell with holotransferrin, which will carry iron through the transferrin receptor into the cell. But then there's also apotransferrin that lacks iron, and that's an iron chelator. So now we can test this iron sensitivity against drugs like apotransferrin or even small molecule chelators and see if it helps the um, PMD oligodendrocytes. So the mutant ones are on the top. Here's, you know, in the case of no transferrin or the holotransferrin carrying iron, these cells are not happy and they die. Um, here are the gene corrected cells at the bottom that are, just don't care so much about the iron. Um, now, if we add apotransferrin, a chelator, the cells survive. Um, we can even add holotransferrin with a small molecule chelator called um, deferoxamine, which is clinically used. Um, and you can get the sense that iron chelators are sufficient to rescue uh, the PMD oligodendrocytes. And all of the pink arrows show the way that the iron chelators help from a variety of parameters, including um, differentiation, cell death, and lipid ROS production. Uh, so what about in vivo? We used a very um, sick um, PMD mouse model called GIMPY, which has a, um, a deletion in exon 5 of the PLP gene. These mice often will die by day 28, and we gave them uh, deferoprone, which is a brain-penetrant version 
of an iron chelator. Again, it's used in children. It's a safe drug, and it's, and it's available both in the US and in Europe. And they had a two-week course of deferoprone uh, with the endpoints of survival, which was um, significantly increased, although you can see not so dramatically increased. And we would probably want to push the deferoprone dosing earlier and higher to really you know, try to improve that survival. But it did, it did decrease um, apoptosis, and it did show preservation or production of myelin under those conditions. So um, that is a sort of a preclinical evidence that a drug which is available um, you know, might have a logic for use in PMD. And this sort of shows now um, kind of you know, the, the, these, these, these findings in our model, uh, where in the PMD uh, mutant or the PLP mutant uh, case, we find a dysregulation of a number of iron metabolic handling proteins. Surprisingly, these cells actually upregulate the transferrin receptor, and so they, they will import too much iron and also um, are prone to this lipid, uh, this iron induced lipid peroxidation, resulting in reactive oxygen species generation and cell death. This occurs right around the time that PLP proteins are produced. <clears throat> and um, so we have some ideas about how the mutant protein could be interrupting the very complex machinery that's required for myelin generation, which is an extraordinarily prolific um, um, synthetic process because when you when an oligodendrocyte myelinates, there is a 7,000-fold increase in cell surface area. <clears throat> so that is an extraordinary change when you go from a premyelinating to a myelinating oligodendrocyte. And we think that things as subtle as a mutation of a myelin protein could be enough to derail that process and sort of set up this toxic situation. That's what we'll be trying to investigate further in the lab. But gene correction is sufficient to restore the balance of iron metabolism and allows the cells to, to um, do their job just fine. Um, so uh, again, I wanted to use that as an example of maybe an insight that we can get from uh, cell-based models. Um, and uh, I also want to also just maybe provide an example of gene therapies. Um, Again, they're in the clinic. Um, spinal muscular atrophy now is an, a good example of where we've progressed from clinical trials to now this is provided in the NHS and will be probably paid for by a lot of American insurers. Um, these could be either antisense oligonucleotide or um, adeno-associated virus therapies and there are a variety of things moving forward. A lot of interest in the rare disease industry and big pharma now starting to focus on orphan diseases so that we may have need a lot more gene therapies in the pipeline in the future. In the last few minutes, uh, I just want to come back to this idea of a predictome. Can we become better at predicting health risk, and how would we, how would we, how would we do that? Um, so this is what we'd like to have, um, is you know, a new kind of newborn screen that is comprehensive and you know, allows us to make better clinical decisions. Um, currently, we don't understand all but a fraction of the genome. Uh, I mentioned all the regulatory regions that we don't understand. Um, and when we have a gen gene problem identified, we don't know if that kid is going to actually have the phenotype to match. There are very few genes that have very high penetrance, like Huntington's disease or familial hypercholesterolemia. Those are ones where you can actually immediately counsel the family and say, we're really worried this is going to impact you. But many other genes, um, maybe a gene for intellectual disability it may or may not actually happen to that child. And you're not going to want to make a decision way ahead of time until you know reliably how to predict health risk. So this is a big issue. And now as genome sequencing is coming into the picture and parents are going to start to get it because they think it's the cool thing to do, it's going to raise a lot of ethical questions about how this information should be used. And if it can be, if people are making decisions, um, you know, without having all the information that um, they need, there, it could, could really start to lead to some real problems. So um, what we want to be able to do is really establish a better connection between genes and outcomes. And this means really thinking long term and using data, obviously, ideally, to be able to make this a feasible task. So let's imagine now you can connect the genetics to actual health outcomes, following the patients prospectively. Or there's a lot more besides health that really contributes to the overall picture. Um, and this is where, again, the UK offers some real interesting uh, advantages for doing this type of project. And we are going to announce soon the establishment of something called the National Institute for Health Research Pediatric Bioresource. It's based on the Biobank, which is a, a, a database that can take genetics information and also health and other outcome data 
and it's a rich data resource that many investigators and companies have used. Um, it has, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients um, that are 30 years and above. There are very few children that are in the biobank, and so the, the gap and, and where we wanted to fill that gap is with the pediatric bioresource that will be zero to 25 years of age. So now, uh, you know, let's imagine they, we're going to start to offer whole genome sequencing in the NHS. We're proposing to do 20,000 trios per year of high-risk children coming into neonatal or pediatric ICU, and some of them will have gene defects, but others won't, or gene diagnoses, others won't, but they're still high risk for other health outcomes. And now we would be able to potentially recruit them into another research project. It's all with consent, um, where you know there could be patient input. We can connect their health records, educational records, which are national in the UK, and there are other mental health, uh, social outcomes that are registered also in the UK. Um, postal codes, very good indicators of environmental exposures. All of that is included in the linkages that you could do in this bioresource. Um, and uh, you can also do periodic updating because maybe uh, a, a negative diagnosis with time we understand more and we can make a better connection between genotype and a clinical diagnosis as we re review this. So every six months, revisiting and re-curating um, all the data to look for new genes and other connections um, as the child grows. Uh, and the, the basic concept is we both want to learn from and benefit the patient. So this is another thing that I think is incredible about the way this bioresource can work is um, the investigator can find something that's genetically new about that child, and we can call the parents and tell them. Sounds pretty obvious. But HIPAA and confidentiality prevents you from doing that in the U.S. unless you've got very specific, you know, um, um, agreement to do that. Um, we can call the doctor. We, we know, and you can also call the patient back and say, oh, there's a new clinical trial that you're eligible for, you know, and make that option available. So this is where benefiting the patient, and you heard that from the parents, how they thought it was useful to have that diagnosis, but what if we could do, you know, more for Millie Mae? We obviously want to be able to contact them. And, and, and then, you know, disappointingly, a lot of the ethics around genetic um, research trials often don't allow you to get back to the patient, and that's a real, I don't know, it's sort of like almost... It's, it's not the way a doctor would want to, you, you really would like to, to have this synergistic relationship where we're going to learn more about how this connects to that and we're going to also be able to have the, parent, the, the patients and the parents feel like, oh, they've really benefited from being in this trial. So that's what we're going to try to achieve. Um, you could imagine also complicated phenotypes like learning disabilities and, um, and mental health outcomes. If we're following them from zero to 25 years of age, 75% of mental health, um, will present by age 25. So we're really in this highly vulnerable age range of intense development where some very important clinical um, uh, phenotypes will develop. Maybe these will also be the origins of physical conditions like diabetes and hypertension. Um, so to um, sum up, um, what I have um, tried to uh, take you through um, is a uh, introduction to whole genome diagnostics in the UK. We're finding that about 30 percent of the patients that we're uh, sequencing have, um, have diagnoses and, and that the ability to scale in, in the UK, how we can use that information uh, as part of new approaches for gene and cell-based therapies for kids with neurogenic conditions, and then this idea of predictive testing. And then I think uh, can we apply these paradigms to common diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular, and mental health? That obviously, in some ways, you could argue that's a more important challenge, but it's not as clear that genetics, this may get us into sort of more polygenetics and much more nature and nurture and really looking at the environmental interactions to get insights there. But we think that the database that we're constructing will at least give us some tools to start to address some of those big questions. Uh, so um, just end by showing uh, the big teams that have been involved in um, the genomic study in Cambridge, um, and also our collaborators um, for the PMD studies, Hiroko, who was the postdoc who led the study with um, Marius and Nan Yang, and then um, this is our team of clinicians that were on the PMD clinical trial. Thanks so much for your attention. I'll stop for questions. Do you think there's any potential for combining it with nutritional 
<clears throat> yeah, so I think, I think that's a great question. So let's say uh, a family with hypercholesterolemia, you know, th then, then there would be a, you know, um, if you will, food as medicine, you know, kind of approach you'd want to take. Um, for um, uh, diabetics, um, risk of type 1, could that actually be um, addressed? Or certainly risk of type 2 and obesity. So um, yes, th th that, that would be the goal, um, is, is to try to, um, you know, either come up with support better health policies, um, but it might be in certain conditions. Like, so familial hy hypercholesterolemia is the one that people keep talking about because it definitely has a health implication. You'll die of a heart attack early. So the, the, you can talk to a patient. They're highly motivated to do what you tell them. And that could either be a drug statin type of approach or that could be, um, or that could be a food approach. I, I think what you're also saying is are we also missing the boat with nutrition and not really looking at the impact that's having um, in food deserts and um, as part of our pediatric practice. Uh, and I think the answer is, you know, yes, we, we, we are, we're not providing clear enough advice. Sugary drinks clearly contributing to obesity and diabetes. Um, some very interesting studies where if you look at in school diet, introducing just a couple of vegetables in ages 0 to 5, 5 to 10, or 10 to 15, 0 to 5 kids actually do it. They actually, and you reduce obesity. And so there are these critical windows probably where if we're going to, you know, so we, 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 we could do more. It would be very helpful. Um, I have a question about what are you doing now with your data in patients where you identify potential mutations in nine genes that are associated So what do you do with that information now yeah. if we don't know what those regions are doing? Um, we're, we're filing them away. Um, so they're all VU, variants of unknown significance. So, so there are a number of things we had to do just because of the rapid turnaround and to be sane. Um, so like we, we were not reporting distant health risks like BRCA. Um, we, um, there were certain things that we just did not do in the context of a rapid turnaround ICU-focused um, project. But these are all variants of unknown significance in the extra genetic regions, and then we also have for example, that, that CDKL5 inversion duplication, that is not a patient who has seizures, um, so we didn't report it as a diagnostic um, CDKL5 deficiency disorder, um, but that will stay in the research database. And as we follow the patient, and if now something else gets reported that's similar, or if that patient develops a seizure later on, that will convert to a diagnosis. Um, yeah, we don't have any of the real cellular uh, detail. Um, the decision to put them into that region was that it's white, it's white matter, but it's, you know, the most superficial. So it would be the least risky. The needle doesn't have to go in more than a couple centimeters. So I think that was the, the rationale. Um, you know, we don't, again, really have that, that cellular detail. We don't know how many cells got it injected because, as I mentioned, we saw a reflux. So, um, that was, you know, a, a, a limitation. We never delivered as much as we had intended. Oh, sorry. So that just means, you know, you're, you're injecting, and you can actually see the, the fluid coming back along the needle track. Yeah, it's literally the cells were not going into the brain. They were just, there was no place for them to go, and they were just squirting back. Uh, and then we also know that two of the kids, so we also just reported uh, last month that two of the four kids, once we took them off, well, Two of them developed um, a class two allo antibody, which is the type of thing you see in, a, in rejection. Um, so those were the those two did not show MRI changes, um, and that would be another reason why maybe the cells could just were all killed. Um, they might have had like a rejection reaction. So, um, you know. No, but that's it is a good question. So the in principle, an iPSC derived would not be immunogenic. So you would bypass that problem. In this case, we needed immunosuppression. We did it for nine months. That was the maximum the FDA would allow because of the risk of immunosuppression. And in one of the two kids that got the ALA antibodies, they did not have them in the first year. 
we stopped the immunosuppression and he developed them the second year. Um, so there, I think there are some lessons from that study about you know future cell-based uh, therapies for the brain. I mean, in some ways it was reassuring for safety. The immunosuppression would, would have to be more aggressive than what we did and other things that could be learned for future studies. Um, no clue. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, no, I, I, I'm sure there are many, many um, just sort of other factors like getting the cells in, and potentially, you know, things that could be enhancing engraftment. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of work in the Parkinson's field. I, th I think I think the delivery base is where you know I think um, there are very few centers that are that are focusing on convection enhanced delivery, um, and um, probably a lot more could be done considering the, the the extent of the problem. There are a lot of labs working on it. Probably Parkinson's will be the case where uh, a lot of the technology will be developed, and then maybe it could extend to these kids. Let's uh, thank Dr. Rovich for. Joining us.